Hey everyone, welcome to the Villa Together podcast with myself, Chris Ellis, and I'm delighted to say that I am joined by a special guest, which is Luis Miguel Echegaray. Absolutely is... amazing. There we go, bang on. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt your intro, Chris. I was so impressed with what you just did there with my name. You'll be surprised how many Brits get it wrong. Uh, that was amazing. Well done. So keep going. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. So the pressure was on there. The pressure was on. Um, for those guys who don't know Luis, he's the host and analyst uh, with CBS Sports. And obviously, as you can see, for those people who are watching on YouTube, those who can't, he's wearing 2015 FA Cup final Aston Villa shirt. Um, and that is the reason he's joining us today. Um, massive thanks for coming on, Luis. Much appreciated. No, thank you so much for having me. Signed by Juan Pablo Angel, by the way. Uh, showing, uh, showing off now, showing off, signed by, <laughs> by none other than Juan Pablo Angel. Um, so obviously you work in and live in America, in New York, um, born in Peru. Actually, I was born in England and I didn't know I was born in England until I was 11, Chris. Uh, my parents were visiting some family members in England when I, uh, when I was like, you know, my mom realized at the time that she was pregnant with me. And then I was born in England. Six months later, I moved back to Peru. And at 11 years old, Chris, my family were like, we're going to leave it, Peru and go back to England. And I said, what do you mean back to England? And they said, oh, you were born there. So my entire family is Peruvian. I am Peruvian. I grew up in Peru. But by complete accident and uh, happenstance, I was born in lovely Blighty, which is uh, what, what, you know, what to my, my journey there. So it's kind of amazing. Sorry, again, to interrupt. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, there you go, then. Um, and obviously, you're a Villa fan. So, you know, obviously, spending spending your, your childhood and growing up in, in Peru and then moving, as, as you just said, back to England at the age of 11, how did you come about kind of supporting Aston Villa? Because, you know, I say traditional. Traditionally, a lot of people would support a football team because, you know, they live nearby or, you know, their parents, brother, sister, whoever it may be, support the club. Obviously, you've got a different story. Yeah, right. And nowadays, I would presume that, uh, you know, beginning to, you know, living in America, you'd be surprised the choices that people make when they support a club. Uh, you obviously know, uh, you know, the American connection to your Arsenals and your Chelsea's and your Liverpool's, etc. So sometimes the, uh, the stories of how people become fans uh, can be interesting. Maybe they're, can't, they're not with me, as you said. It's kind of unique, really. There's a piece that I just wrote about it on CBS Sports. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, you know, my family Peruvian, I'm Peruvian, grew up in Peru. Um, and uh, I moved to England when I was 11. I, I was culture shocked. I, I didn't know what to expect out of the United Kingdom. Um, you know, I knew English, but not, you know, so well that I knew, to, that I knew obviously, you know, the slang and everything like that. And I moved to London, by the way. And, you know, I, I moved to an area where, uh, you know, half the community was Arsenal. No, so I'm sorry, half the community was uh, Greek. The other half was Turkish. And I kept saying, oh, the Greeks thought I was Turkish and the Turkish thought I was Greek. And I was like, I'm Peruvian. And, and they had no idea what that meant. Uh, but also they were all like Arsenal fans, Tottenham fans. I wanted nothing to do with that. Uh, and I was pretty, I was pretty lonely kid at the beginning, right? It, you know, the foreigner, the, the immigrant, I didn't know anybody. But I made friends with this kid, Mark, the most gigantic, obsessive Aston Villa fan. Oh. And this was, by the way, the year right after we came second, right? And the debut of the Premier League. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, he, he was my very first best friend in, in the UK. And I would go to his house after school. We would play World Cup in the, you know, in, in the park. Do you remember, you know, like you pick your country, whatever. But with us, yeah. we would pick teams and... We would pick Villa and I had nothing. I didn't know anything about Villa and he took me to his house and there was his room. Dalian Atkinson on the wall and, you know, uh, you know, Saunders and then obviously Dwight York and everything like that. And, and I, you know, uh, Cyril Regis. And I was just like completely just, you know, I, I felt like I entered home. Everything about Villa just made sense. And ever since then, my friend, uh, I became a, a Villa fan. And to be honest with you, it became a relationship where they helped me because, you know, being uh, an immigrant and a different uh, from a different country, Villa helped me along the way. I would go to Villa Park. I would see through the years, they became the closest thing that made me feel uh, finally at home. And, and that's why I'm a Villa fan. There we go. Amazing. Like, like I say, it's, 
it's always interesting hearing different stories about how they've come to support Aston Villa. You know, it's, it's not just Aston Villa. Obviously, football fans all over the world, all obviously all over the UK and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of fans all over the world, and it's just amazing hearing the different stories because, like I say, you know, traditionally people usually follow somebody like their, you know, they, their dad maybe will say, I'm a Villa fan. You support right. Villa, stuff like that. I mean, for me personally, my, my dad doesn't like football, has never liked football. So I think literally I, I looked in the um, the paper to look at the football teams, to look at who was local. And I looked and I was like, on, okay, Aston Villa, they're Birmingham. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for Aston Villa. So then it was kind of like to my mum and dad, it was like, oh, I support Aston Villa. And they were like, oh, I, I, my dad was born in Birmingham. Um, he was born, shall we say, closer to the dark side. Um, <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, I, d- I don't want to mention that team, um, yeah, but but not not being a football fan, um, so for me it was kind of I don't want to say easy because I, I kind of had to get into it myself in terms of you know finding out about other you know football teams and stuff like that. But I just was like, okay, who's local? We'll go for Aston Villa. Yep, yeah, there we go, and it went from there. Um, what about kind of you know you're in England, you're in London, um, growing up, you've become an Aston Villa fan. What about then when it was a case of wanting to to go and see Aston Villa? Yeah, I mean, obviously that was uh, difficult and hardly ever an opportunity. And it's, it's not like my family had a lot of money, so it's not like I could afford to uh, go to a game, let alone a ticket to, to you know, to see all the way uh, to Birmingham and, and see the Villa. So it was, it was never going to be easy, but we made it happen every now and again, birthdays and Christmas presents. And Mark, the, this uh, aforementioned friend I talked about, yeah. his family would sometimes take me to see a game so it just became and when i went to university you know that became more uh more casual for me to try and you know just go over there and uh, and see a game so it wasn't as frequent uh and obviously as you mentioned even you know going to the pub like somewhere in london and watching villa and wearing villa was difficult i remember the fa cup final the last one in the old wembley stadium villa against chelsea yep. such a boring game and, and then they win one nothing but i watched that one in a pub in uh, in Chelsea wearing Villa and yeah that 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 pretty much was almost suicidal to do that uh, so because you know it wasn't exactly uh, popular for anybody to do this so it wasn't as easy to go to the games but the older I got the better and the easier it was actually a few years ago when we went to England to see some family my wife surprised me with um, with tickets to to see Villa and it was the Villa Leeds game in the Championship when we were two nothing up and. They come back to win three two. Obviously, not the result that we wanted, but yeah. but it was a it was a really lovely surprise. You know, I had no idea we were going to go, and my wife surprised me with tickets. So it's moments like that that I'm allowed to do it. But like we said before taping, it's so great uh, when you hear perspectives from Villa fans all over the world, and yep. when they get that chance to see Villa Park, it's so so it is that moment is that much more precious. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, we we said um, we were chatting just before we were recording. And, um, and I've spoken to all sorts of different Villa vans all around the world. And I am um, I live in Stourbridge, so I'm Dudley Way, 30, 45 minutes away from Villa Park. And I was kind of saying, for me, it doesn't feel like I'm close to Villa Park, but obviously for other people, obviously for like yourself as well, it yeah, is, da- like, it is yeah. down the road, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you you know, these all these people that I've spoken to would love to be 30 to 45 minutes from Villa Park. And for me, it feels like I'm far away from Villa Park, where obviously take look at different perspectives i'm close in comparison so yeah it, it is great to look at perspective and things like that and obviously at the moment um obviously no one can get to, to Villa. Yeah, everybody park. feels distant from Villa park at the moment right it doesn't matter yeah, where you yeah. are yeah exactly very good point yeah 100 percent um it's yeah what about so so how how many years were you, you were from 11 to uh, and then I stayed, yeah, 23. I, I finished uni and then I moved to New York right after that. I mean, I always went back to England every now and again because my sister still lives there. I have aunts and some family as well who also immigrated to England from there. So I have family still there. So I go every now and again, but I left myself at, at 23. So, um, you know, and that was around 2003, 2002 time. So uh, ever since then, I've returned every now and again, but I permanently moved to the States uh, in 2002, 2003. Are your, are your family that live in England, are they based in London still? 
yeah, some of them are based in London, others are based just outside it, like like West Sussex. My sister lives in Oxford, actually. Yeah. Uh, so they're all over the place, but mo more in the south. Uh, you won't get more north than Oxford for uh, for my family at this point. But yeah, everybody's south. So I never really get a uh, a family member that goes any further up. It's kind of hard to have. Uh, I mean, well, aside from the Nolberto Solano uh, Newcastle connection, there's not many Peruvians in, uh, you know, the further you go up uh, England, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Solano played for Villa at one point as well, didn't he? Absolutely. He did. Absolutely. That great goal against Tottenham, if we remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good goal. Yeah. I remember, I'm sure. Yeah. I remember seeing it's behind a goal when he scored free kick, I think, against Liverpool once. He was. Um, very good player in all fairness I think you know especially obviously he did a lot more at Newcastle he was there a lot longer wasn't he but you know I suppose he's the um the main kind of Peruvian representative Premier League I don't know if any other Peruvian players off the top of your head you can think of played in the Premier League uh well no not really I think Nolbert Torson uh, well Claudio Pizarro of course had his moment with Chelsea uh yeah. but that was at the tip like later in his career there wasn't anybody else Andre Carrillo uh, was with Watford for a little bit but he didn't really have a moment Nolbert, uh, Nolberto Solano really is symbolic with uh, I mean well he was the first Peruvian that moved to the Premier League thanks to that Newcastle move of course as you mentioned later Villa they actually Newcastle right now have a Peruvian in their books right now uh Rodrigo Vilca who plays for the under 23 so yep. hopefully we'll get more Peruvians coming in I would love uh there's a player called uh, Renato Tapia Renato Tapia who's the uh he plays for Celta Vigo. He's going to be the future captain of Peru. I would love for Villa to get him. He plays right in, right in that Douglas Luiz spot. Uh, you know, so a backup to him or maybe somebody else with him, that would be amazing. X, is he X Feyenoord, Tapia? That's right. Well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, a, yeah he's a good player. I think he would fit that, that Douglas Luiz role. Um, yeah, he'd be a good player to get in. You have to, um, have, a word with that. have a word with Dean Smith. Get him, yeah. get him in. If so, Douglas Luiz yeah. does end up going... Chris, do you mean December Manager of the Month, Dean Smith? Is that how you're talking? Yeah, yeah, December Manager of the Month, 2020, Dean Smith. That's the one. And I think I read it's the, the first time uh, at last the Villa Manager has won Manager of the Month since 2010. And it seems like 2010 is the year that we seem to be kind of going back to for a lot of these records that, that yeah. Dean Smith and Aston Villa seem to be breaking. So I think yeah. that's, re that's reflective of, you know, between 2010 and 2020 and now 2021, that kind of gap that we've had in terms of where quality and, and results and stuff is a bit of a void really, isn't there? Yeah, it's amazing. It really is. 2010 really marks like the beginning of the end of the beginning of the end. And then now to where we are and just for Dean Smith to get that award, by the way, to become the fourth boss of Villa since uh, what Brian Little, John Gregory, and then Martin O'Neill. It's, it's really amazing. So it's just, it's just good times. I mean, I know that obviously with the COVID situation, I feel for the squad, I feel for the staff, I hope they'll recuperate, but it's just, it's always worth remembering just how much this club has gone through. And, and it's just, you know, I know that there's still uh, light at the end of the tunnel with this COVID stuff and it's only going up for us. Uh, I feel very proud of being a Villa fan, to be honest these days. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that that's one of the things that, in all fairness, um, we we spoke to um, we spoke to actually uh, Brett Holman, um, ex Aston Villa. Spoke to him yesterday. Yeah, that's great. And he he was talking about when when he came to Villa, it it was almost uh, obviously he came in. He was signed by Alex McLeish. Paul Lambert then came. So by the time he'd actually come and started training with the club, Paul Lambert had come in. So signed by a different manager. And he said it was almost like those times where you could tell the team were were on the on the down on the decline compared to obviously under Martin O'Neill. And then he followed after he left, he still followed Aston Villa. We got relegated to the Championship, and it was almost as if those times in the Championship helped us rebuild ourselves back up. And also, it felt like um, it helped us kind of help connect the club back to the fans. I think that's really important because. Those years under, I'm not, you know, not blaming Paul Lambert, but those years under Paul Lambert, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the ownership and bad decisions in the transfer market and stuff like that. But those years were tough as a fan, obviously tough for the players as well. Um, but then going down and then coming back up with one of our own in Dean Smith, as Guy we've just mentioned, um, it seems like the connect is right back there. And as you say, it just feels so good to be an Aston Villa fan right now, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, and you hit on so many points here that I totally agree with. And something that I actually remember saying, I think it was the first time we got, you know, uh, when we were really dealing with the relegation at the very beginning. 
Um, I, I felt like I said, listen, nobody wants to get relegated, but, but I feel like Villa needed to. We needed to just like, I know that from a financial uh, perspective, that's just crazy talk. But honestly, for, literally from what you just said, from, the, from just building the, in, in order to create strength once again, you sometimes have to break it up yeah. again. And I feel that's what happened for us. We kind of woke up a little bit. Um, and even with the Tony Shi uh, times, you know, we needed to sort of understand, you know, the complexities of what was going on. And we needed to get relegated to understand just how precious this club is. I mean, come on, we've won the European Cup. Not many people can say that in, in England. And, and it, it, would just, it just needed to be this wake-up call. And to your point, we needed somebody. And how perfect it is that Dean Smith whose father was a steward at Villa Park, who would walk Sir Doug Ellis to his seat, like just a Villa person through and through, our captain who's been there since, you know, eight years old. Those kind of stories, they all make much more sense now because we needed to struggle first. I think we needed to get relegated in order to wake up again. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think a lot of people agree with you because go being in the championship, it just felt like, oh, I suppose, you know, you kind of expect to maybe win more when you're in a championship. But at the same time, you look at the likes of Sunderland, um, you know, Bradford, teams that have dropped out of the Premier League, dropped through the championship and, and, and haven't come back. So there's still that that risk and it's not always going to be easy. But to coming back, it just felt like that connect was there. And obviously now we can see the rewards because we're doing reasonably well at the moment. Difficult times for everybody, not just footballers and football teams at the, the present moment. Um, what about now, not just now, but the last, say, the last however many years since you've been in, in America, what about, um, you know, that, that period in terms of how you would, would watch football matches? Because obviously watching Aston Villa games, because obviously the, the time difference and things like that. How have you been able to go about that? So at the very beginning, when I first moved to America, it wasn't that easy, right? Because now... You know, these kids of today, Chris, I'm going to sound like a granddad, but these kids, they don't realize how good they have it. You know, you you have all these apps, you have all these like, you know, social media platforms that you can just see a goal here and there, et cetera. If you want to just like stream something, you probably can find one way to do it back then. It wasn't that easy. I remember the very first few years, I would have to go to Irish or English pubs in New York. Yeah. who had the special package, who played Premier League matches. And obviously, you know, if it was a Champions League game, you know, regardless of Villa, but if it was a Champions League game, that's obviously around 2.45 in the afternoon. But if it's Villa on the weekend, obviously you have to uh, get up early. Uh, uh, and if it's an early game, forget about it, 7.30 in the morning. And I lived in LA for a little bit and that was bad. That was 4.30 in the morning. Uh, <laughs> You know, where you would have to find a bar where, uh, you know, you would try and get a game and stuff. But as the years went on, now the U.S., people don't realize, and you'd be surprised, like, maybe not. But the U.S., in America, the amount of options that you have in order to watch a game is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. I mean, we have, uh, you know, NBC to CBS to ESPN Plus to all these apps. Like you can see a game, whatever game you want. Obviously, when we were in the championship, it was a little harder. So you would have to do it directly through the website, but it's become easier. But back then it was wake up really early, go to the Irish pub who was open at the time because they knew there was a clientele for it. And then I would sit at the back. And yeah, I would get a pint, you know, nine in the morning and just uh, watch the villa. So it wasn't, I, I actually miss it because it was kind of cool. You would go to a bar and see it. And all these Americans that don't follow the game would be like, are you crazy? What are you doing in a pub at eight in the morning and stuff? But but it's now much easier, though those bars continue uh, and it's great to see. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's, that's something, again, talking about, you know, these people in the different, uh, different countries and that the dedication to being able to watch Aston Villa. And again, it shows the, the kind of commitment to the cause and the love being there. Um, one thing as well is obviously now the MLS is is, is pretty big and it's, it's getting bigger and growing and there's a lot of different, you know, I suppose legends of the Premier League have played in and now manage and own in, in the MLS at the moment. What mm -hmm. about, you know, you going back when, when you know, you've, you've, you came to America... Um, supporting and following Villa and stuff like that. What about people's perception of you supporting a football team and supporting Aston Villa, who I imagine a lot of people may not have heard of? 
yeah, it was, I mean, it was, I mean, to be honest with you, it was just as weird as a reception as it was if I said it in England, because you're Peruvian, that you support Villa, but you live yeah. in the south of England. Like, uh, so def definitely at the very beginning, people were like, what, what? They didn't even know what Aston Villa was sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but as the years went on, and obviously the game grew, because here's the thing, it's all relative to how big the game, as you said, not just MLS, but just the overall interest in the game has grown in the United States. You know, between the ages of around 12 to 21, football slash soccer is the most popular sport in this country. It's a growing, growing sport because young people, you know, who are so much more aware and have so much more availability to watch games can now see it everywhere. So that's a big thing. But obviously back then, you know, as we mentioned in the, the beginning of the 21st century, it was a little bit harder. So definitely at the very beginning, but I did live in New York. So people came from everywhere. So they, they were kind of receptive to it. And obviously there was some American contingencies that played for Aston Villa, of course, Brad Guzan, et cetera. So yeah. people did kind of know it, but now forget about it. Everybody, everybody knows what you're talking about. You talk about the Villa. Yeah, definitely. It's one of the things it's it's kind of, I suppose you, you've kind of knocked it on the head there where you say a Peruvian supporting Aston Villa who lives in the south of England, you know, people kind of think, well, how's he ended up supporting Aston Villa of all teams? But to be honest yeah. with you, Chris, in Peru, it's where I get the bigger question. My, my <laughs> aunts, my God, they're like, Aston, what? Why? Like, and then you have to explain the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, but it, that's just football for you. I've spoke exactly. so many, so many people you speak to, and you just think, you know, football just it's just great for for kind of stories and, and memories and moments like that. It's just brilliant, and it's and football overall is just great how it brings people together. Um, what about so just before we move on to talking more about about you and your, your career and all that kind of stuff, we have touched on Dean Smith and the current team and all that kind of stuff. As long as uh, there isn't any kind of monumental um, changes uh, that the government may enforce in terms of Premier League football carrying on. It seems like that is going to be the case. Even though personally, Aston Villa have had a bit of a COVID issue. What are, what are your kind of your hopes and aspirations for Aston Villa, and realistically for this season? Uh, you know, taking our, our good start into consideration. Yeah, no, that's the operative word there, Chris. Realistic. We have to be very realistic about what we can achieve. And actually, I feel that many Villa fans should kind of do some self-reflection and think, let's not wish for too much. And let me, let me just explain what I mean. We are still in the developmental stage with, uh, you know, Nassif Sawiris and, and Wes Edens, like, you know, in terms of the ownership and the guidance and what this club represents, especially with you know, Langen now being our sporting director and Dean Smith, et cetera. So I think we're doing amazing. And I want us to do amazing. I wonder if, you know, obviously anybody would say, oh, let's get a Champions League spot. But I wonder if like that's too much for us to chew. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, I feel that we need to just keep taking simplistic, realistic steps in order for us to truly deliver. Because I think that's the ultimate way how we're going to succeed. We've had stories before of other clubs who like have done so well, they made it to the Champions League. And then the following season, it's kind of like, you know, in America, they call it the sophomore slump. It's the same situation. I mean, it's not the same kind of mirror image, but Sheffield United, look at what's happening to them right now. They were so good last year. Now they're really struggling. I'm not saying that we are Sheffield United. I'm saying that our objectives should be realistic to what we can do the following season. So I, I feel that Europa League is a realistic target. I feel that if we don't get it, it's okay. A top 10 place is amazing, right? Europa League is definitely doable. I just want us to be very careful about what we do. But then the biggest caveat, though, is that what happens if we don't get Europa and we're going Champions League? Then we, you know, the possibility of losing Jack Grealish is a major, major talking point. Now, yeah. do we care as much? Because, you know, I remember... You know, many young Villa fans won't remember this, but, you know, Manchester United broke my heart when Dwight York, uh, you know, went to, you know, he's my hero, uh, you know, so w went to Manchester United. So to me, I, I, and many Villa fans, as you, as you yourself, we, we are too aware of losing our heroes to bigger clubs. So I'm more than ready when Jack Grealish, if that, this, and by the way, nobody should ever blame him if, he ever, if it ever happens. He has given everything for this club. But I think that we have to meet two things. One, be realistic about what we want. And also, how much can we sell this project 
to Jack Grealish and so forth. I don't think a club should be completely be based around Jack Grealish, but obviously uh, he is a major part of what we want to do. But I think that Europa League spot is very realistic and a top 10 spot it should be, at this moment, should be, that's exactly what we should be expecting, a top 10 side. And if we can get Europa, fantastic. Yeah, I think it, it's what's what's interesting when you mention um, simplistic steps. And I think that's something that I've mentioned to a lot of people when people have asked me, um, you know, where do you think Villa will finish and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> if you go back to last season and we finished 17th by, by one point on the last day, exactly. how, you know, people always talk about Hawkeye and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, we were fortunate, but taking that to one side, we stayed up on the last day by one point. So if you look, if you're taking it by step by step, the next step from that would be improving on 17th place. And that would probably be anything above 17th, but without any real relegation threat or battle. So you kind of enjoy yourselves a bit more and you're not always worried. Because last season, for a good portion of the, of, of the start of this year, so the early early start of 20, 2020, a good portion where it seemed like, oh God, you know, we're in a proper relegation battle here. So then I think the next step from that this season would be avoiding that obviously we, we look like we've gone gone beyond that because i think we're on 26 points now we were on 27 points when we came back uh in project restart which was in june uh, um, yeah. and then we, we only got an extra what, eight points from that um, which which kept us up which was obviously fantastic but it just kind of shows how far we've come um so in my head part of me is thinking okay top 10 you know is is you know and that, that's a solid that's you t- you're looking at steps that's probably two three four steps up from what we could have envisaged off the back of last season. Um, so then realistically, you kind of look and say, okay, Europa League would be fantastic. Um, I, I totally agree with you. It is kind of, a lot of that would be, you know, you want Europa League to try and, um, you know, show Jack Grealish that those are the steps that we're taking. Um, and it is realistic, but you just don't know, because this year, you know, 20, 2020, 2021 has been, a you know, it's been an odd season for ourselves and a lot of teams as well. So it's kind of... Um, it's one of them uh, in terms of, of moving forward and hopefully we can uh, we can push on, so to speak, because uh, it has been fantastic. Um, so I, I totally agree with everything you've said. Um, well, we'll move on and, and talk about you, obviously, you know, move to America. You've had, um, obviously, roles in terms, you've worked at The Guardian, Sports Illustrated, CBS Sports. Um, what was it that kind of got you into um, the sports industry? Yeah, that's funny. It's actually a good question because, you know, what's funny is I didn't even enter this industry until 2015. Um, you know, it's, it's not that long ago. Um, I actually was an actor for 15 years. I, you know, crappy theater and, and crappy B movies between New York. That's why I moved to New York to go to acting school. And that was my life uh, for a long, long period. And it wasn't until 2015 when I decided I wanted to change careers and football was always a big part of my life. My dad introduced it to me, you know, obviously when I was very young, as many of us can relate to back in Peru, that's exactly what happened to me. And I I played it a pretty good level. I played it at uni and stuff. So it was always a big part of my life. Uh, so I knew that sports was always going to be, and I wanted to combine storytelling and creative thinking, and, and reporting and writing with sports. And so in 2015, that's when I really started. So I did a, a master's program at, in, in New York for one year. I, I dedicated myself to learning about the craft of it. And, you know, I just hustled. I worked my absolute butt off to try and, you know, see where I could work or offer. So I started at Vice. I did some things for some Spanish speaking channels here called uh, Univision and Telemundo. Um, I sold a piece to Newsweek and then and then I worked at The Guardian and then that kind of snowballed into Sports Illustrated for three years. And now finally, uh, my dream job here at CBS Sports. So it hasn't been that long. It's just uh, I just I, I basically work up very hard <laughs> to try and get to a point where I wanted to make this uh, my career now. And now here it is. So it hasn't been that long. But, you know, I think it's a good example of showing. Listen, it's really not about like the length of experience, but rather how much you want it and how much you're willing to do. Uh, for very little, because at the very beginning, I was willing to do things for nothing. And I think that has to be the mentality. So yeah, very, very humbled and very proud and happy to say that it hasn't been a long journey in sports uh, journalism and sports media, uh, but it's been definitely a tough one. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's kind of it's the, the key element um, to it. 
um, you know, putting in the hard work and having that mentality. And I know there's a lot of people that I've um, collaborated with and done stuff with who do um, similar kind of things, uh, football podcasts and stuff like that, who are hoping to get into the football kind of media kind of world. So obviously, you know, showing that it's not a case of stay in something for so long you'll get the dream job you put in that work the effort and you'll kind of get there and obviously you show in, in you know perfect example of putting in that hard work and dedication and yeah as, as we can see you know you, you're fantastic at what you, what you do you can get what is you know a dream job it's you know, you've taken a different route to what you wanted to do but got a job that obviously uh one that you, that you wanted to get to no, I appreciate it. Really, really kind words. Uh, and listen, the, every time, because I also teach at the school I did my master's in, I like to give back to, to uh, these kids. And I always give them some pieces of advice. And it's like, listen to me. Like, people are going to be more talented than you. It's just going to happen. People are going to have more connection than you. It's going to happen. But one thing that people cannot outdo you on is your hustle. So, you know, outwork everybody else. If they want 20%, give them 50 if they're willing to give you, you know, 20 pounds for a word or a sentence or 100 pounds for an article, you know, uh, give them two articles. You know, just I know that at the very beginning, it may sound like it's not fair. But to me, that's the ultimate way. Show them extra hustle and then some because uh, nobody will be able to take away your hustle. People will be more talented. People will, you know, be more connected. They'll be luckier. Right. But what they can't prove is to show that they're harder workers than you. And that's the only thing that I've always worked at, to be honest with you. And that, yeah. that's it, really. No, it's very wise words. And it's uh, something certainly for people who may be listening or watching to, to kind of t take inspiration from and draw from. Um, just before we go, obviously, we're on a podcast. So tell us more about your podcast. Um, obviously, I've watched a lot of the episodes. You've had some fantastic guests on there. It's a great watch. It's a great listen. So, so tell us more about it and how you've kind of got into it. Yeah, no, thanks, buddy. Yeah, so Kego Lasso, basically, we launched it in October, mid-October last year. And that's basically why I joined CBS. We wanted to grow. Um, obviously, we're putting a lot of emphasis into football. Uh, this is a, a, a network that truly cares, a platform that truly cares about the game. So uh, my podcast is, uh, CBS podcast is uh, Kego Lasso. And it's basically everything that you wanted, analysis, betting tips, uh, interviews, previews and recaps uh you know weekdays but we like to celebrate this game some of the best compliments i've had about the podcast is like it makes you feel like you're part of a family and that's what i want people to feel like that it's not you know i think that there's a lot of quality podcasts of football out there so many of them i wanted to just create also a celebratory style podcast and that's what cbs sports has been able to do i think so it's just a fantastic opportunity and you said you know you know we have tremendous contributors there's Jimmy Conrad, who uh, played for the United States men's national team yeah. and MLS player as well, former defender of the year. He had a tremendous historic tackle on Lionel Messi when the U.S. played Argentina. They should watch it. Heath Pierce as well. We have Jonathan Johnson, uh, correspondent in Paris. James Bench, correspondent in the U.K. Uh, Roger Gonzalez. We also have amazing, amazing Fabrizio Romano as part of our team. And if you don't have Fabrizio Romano, what the hell are you doing? Because yeah, he's exactly, yeah. the transfer guru. Uh, and also, I, like you said, great interviews. We've had Thierry Henry on the show, Gonzalo Higuain, Gabriel Agbonlahor, Inola Aluko, Nigel Rio Coker, Emil Heskey. Uh, we had a, like a Villa week last year, I think. <laughs> I remember so many. So it's just, you know, it's just a great celebration of the game. And like you said, it's not just on, on audio, but it's also on video, on YouTube. And we're also on CBS Sports HQ as well. Uh, and it's just a great opportunity uh, to really just show what this uh what this uh platform can offer i think what like what you said about it um is spot on it's you can kind of obviously there's a lot of um, sports and football podcasts all over the place all over the world that people do and obviously these guys do them especially the kind of you know top end do them because they know their stuff but sometimes you need more than that so obviously with yours it's like you say you've got that it's almost like whoever you're with, everyone together are a big part of it and that they buy into it and everyone knows their stuff. It's bang on. And, and there'll, there'll be people listening um, who certainly know that in the UK, obviously Sky Sports is the kind of big one for us when we're listening to transfers and things like that. But sometimes 
they don't know their stuff. It's just they they're going off because they're Sky Sports and things like that. But when you know you're chatting to you've got guys like Fabrizio Romano and, and stuff like that, it's just it, it's everything that goes with the energy and everything that, that's brought to together with it. it. It's one of them that you guys certainly know your stuff and you know what you're talking about. At the same time, you just can't stop listening or watching. However, people, you know, I've watched it on YouTube, listen to it as well, and you just can't stop. And it's and it's kind of exactly what you said bringing people and they feel part of it on the sat there watching it i'm thinking i'm part of this i'm in this right now <laughs> you so are is, my friend <laughs> well, we are right now but honestly people are, the, um, i'll put it uh well, i'll put it in the description uh the link to it everything on like that i recommend it's a real real good watch or listen to now there's a lot of people who um who i speak to who will use youtube others will use the other kind of podcast platforms it's a real real good watch and or listen um both of them fantastic so hats off to you because it's it's just one of them that i think sometimes with with podcasts it's not just somebody kind of um you know stood behind a microphone or a camera or both churning facts and figures that yeah okay they might be bang on but, but sometimes you just have to have that personality you have to buy into it you have to put the hard work and everything into it and you certainly do that so that that's what makes your podcast just a real real good listen Oh, I really, really appreciate that. And by the way, I'm going to uh, send you some money uh, at the end of this for just basically being my promotional cheerleader right now for what you just did there. It was amazing. <laughs> and I, by I the thought, way... I thought we are going to keep that off air. I said keep it off air. Don't mention people. <laughs> and by the way, uh, it's very Villa-centric. Jonathan Johnson is also a Villa fan. Uh, everybody else in this show just it has had enough because we're always talking about Villa one way or another. But I don't care, man. It's my show. I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got, you got to do it. And at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's the way it is. It's, we've had, um, there's, a, there's a lot of Aston Villa podcasts, um, you know, in the UK. Um, and they seem to be growing week on week. And there's, there's been uh, a couple of times where we've done um, episodes where, that I've hosted where we, we've, we've done like a debate about the kind of, all-time greatest Aston Villa 11 and we've had all of us together on Zoom so there's been like 10 or 12 of us oh, that's and great. It, yeah it's just been great because we all do podcasts or, or or similar so we all love it so having us together it's just great because you know it's like me and you now and as you say when you're on your podcast and it's Villa people together it's just great and that's kind of where where the name of of my podcast come, comes from because it started because me and my friend every morning we'd talk on the phone on the way when we were on our way to our respective jobs we talk on the phone and it would be a quick 10 15 20 seconds how are you how's the family and then the next hour and so would be aston villa, villa. so it's, it's so that's where it is it's villa together it's always about villa together and it's sounds like it's the same with you when you're doing yours with, with people on the podcast so absolutely and that's honestly the overall message of the game right it's just about bringing people together that's why absolutely. it's really not that dissimilar to calling it a religion it's exactly what we're all about we love it and aston villa is the greatest football club the world has ever seen exactly exactly i i <clears throat> I often say that to my son. He's nine, and you kind of don't say it too much, though, Chris, because I feel that sometimes they want to go against the father, right? So, like, yeah. you, you... <laughs> I know, I know, exactly, I know exactly what you mean. Because I'll say to him, I say, ask them, you know, or you might do a chant, you know, Grace, you ever seen all this kind of stuff? And he's like, Dad, you know, that they're eighth in the Premier League, and you're like, that's good, that's really good. You know, you, I'm not expecting us to win the Champions League, all that kind of stuff. Just, just, just get on board, you know. Um, but you, you can't help but, you know, support the club. You can't help but, but not say it, can you? You're not gonna be like, oh, we're rubbish, you know. It's- yeah, no, absolutely. Are you kidding? When we were like relegated, I was like, we're still the best club in the world. <laughs> yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just, we're terrible, but we're still amazing. <laughs> yeah, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Okay, just yeah. carry on as normal. Nothing's changed. Yeah. Uh, but, exactly. it's like, but like, you know, it's, it's exactly what you know. The reason why why we've done this today is. You know, you were, I was going to say, you know, you, you spent part of your life in Peru from Peruvian family, actually born in England, spent part of your life in England, became an Aston Villa fan. As you said, Peruvian in South of England, supporting Aston Villa. It's just one of them. It's just what football is all about. Football, it doesn't matter who you support. You just love and dedication for it is, is fantastic. And, um, you know, it's great to, to kind of hear your story and how you've become an Aston Villa fan. Amen, my friend. Thank you so much. By the way, who's your favorite Villa player? What was all, of all time or now? Of all time. Well, tell me now. Okay, favorite at the moment is Jack Grealish. I can't, I can't move away from him. I love, I love him. He, he makes me feel really special. <laughs> I, I can't. I, like watching him play, it's, it's amazing. It really is. I love it. Um, yeah. If I, 
of all time, I'd have to say Gareth Barry. Um, wow. I think okay. what, I know he was he was a part of of the side that that Martin O'Neill built. I felt like he was an integral cog of that. I know he left um, and went to, went to Man City. He was, but um, I just felt he kind of he was there just before the start of that, and he always he wore his heart on his sleeve, and he always put one hundred and ten percent in. It was just yeah. brilliant to watch, and he obviously he had a lot of talent as well, and he turned into a fantastic player. Um, and yeah, he was I just loved him in you know growing up and and kind of um, you know through the through what was was our our most successful recent period if you like um so yeah i'd have to go what, what about you same, same question yeah. to you well gareth barry unsung hero absolutely i feel as well like you know such a consistent player people forget about that well listen now you just you can't say you can say anybody else other than jack Grealish, right i just i just think that uh people need to realize especially young villa fans uh there was a player england had called paul gascoigne and paul gascoigne was so unique in the way that he played. Yep. It, it was like he drew people in. I mean, he was very, you know, it, it was beautiful to watch. Uh, Jack Grealish, I feel, is, you know, capable of not just doing what Paul Gascoigne did, but possibly better. I, ju I just think that there is no player in the world that does what Jack Grealish does. It's, it's incredible to me. He is a magician. It's a, it, he draws the defender in, luring you, until he makes that perfect timing move. It's just, there is no skill set that anybody else in the world, and I'm including Lionel Messi, I'm sorry, that what Jack Grealish gives you. I'm not saying Jack Grealish is the best player in the world. I'm just saying that he's the most unique player, and I think that there's still more to come from. So for now, it has to be Jack Grealish. Though, special mention to uh, Emiliano Martinez. I'm just so happy he's a Villa good player. I just love him so much. But uh, overall... Um, you know, my story obviously is about Villa helping me connect with England and etc. like that. And that player to me was Dwight York. He he forever will be my hero. Uh, just everything that he did. And when he went to Manchester United, I didn't talk to anybody for like two weeks. I was so depressed. Uh, it, like he created a big impact on my life, Dwight York. But again, special mention to Juan Pablo Angel, who I thought was just like beautiful to watch as a Villa player. Ian Taylor, who I can now call a friend. Uh, Gabriel Agbonahor, like Gabby, was just amazing. But to me, Dwight York is like my favorite ever Villa player. And I just watch him, you know, the things that he did was amazing. And, and had Manchester United not taken him, oh, the things we could have done. The things we could have done. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we spoke to Ian Taylor uh, a few months back and he said, you, that at the time they felt like as long as they could keep a goal out and they defended well that they had Dwight York up the other end who you knew he could he could score all types of goals left foot right foot you know headers everything he was such a good player and I think people who probably you know aren't old enough to have seen enough of him uh, probably don't realise how good he genuinely was he was such a good player and you know he kind of speaks volumes as well um, you know he went to Manchester United and he was part of a side, one of the greatest sides that, that the Premier League has seen. And, you know, they won the treble, yeah. um, you know. And one of the best partnerships the game has ever seen, him and Andy Cole as well. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, it's the right move for him. I will never be angry about it. I was just very sad because Dwight yeah. York was just like such a hero. Uh, but, you know, more heroes to come with Villa. I just know it. Look at what Louis Barry did. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, exactly. So th there will certainly be more to come. Um, but a massive, massive thanks for coming on. Uh, everyone listening, um, make sure you you follow all the links at the bottom. Um, just want to, just before we go, give a, a shout out on your for your social media, so what you, how, how we can get in touch with you and, and, and follow you on social media. Yeah, no, thank you. It's L-M-H-E-G-A-R-I, and you're not going to know how to spell that, so you're going to have to see this on YouTube or on uh, Chris's description to see it. So it's L-M-E-C-H-E-G-A-R-A-Y on Twitter. And on Instagram, it's uh, Luis M. Echegaray on Instagram. So those two, you can follow me. But Twitter, uh, that's where you can see way more uh, Villa. I have Dwight York as my background. That's where you see way more Villa stuff there. Yeah, yeah definitely. You see Luis, um, you'll, you'll see him pop up with his tweets after the games and stuff like that. He's heavily involved. Um, he is a massive Aston Villa fan, as we've just chatted for the last... 40 minutes or so um, but yeah once again massive thanks for coming on uh, big thank you everyone listening uh, thanks for uh, Luis Miguel Echegaray coming on Villa together it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much 
Thank you so much, bud. Up the villa. Up the villa. Thank you very much. Uh, make sure everyone listening, uh, follow Luis on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Also, make sure you watch his podcast. Everything is in the description. And everyone listening, if you're not subscribed, make sure you hit the subscribe button uh, on YouTube. But massive thank you once again. Thank you.